Okay, great. Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, so I will uh, talk about structures in disks and planet disk interaction for the next uh, 15 minutes. So this is the famous object uh, HL Tau, and this is not an ARMA image, but this is looked with ARMA, which is a previous in, uh, generation interferometer. So we had pretty decent resolution of about 0.1 to 0.2 arc second, but at that moment, there was no clear evidence of substructure in this disk. And as you might have seen at this point, this is the image what ARMA has taken at about 0.03 arc, arc second resolution or three to four, arc, four AU resolution. And what you see here is just stunning image of the disk, of course, but you see that those particles, uh, millimeter sized grains, they are structures. Uh, they are structured in narrow rings and gaps in the disk. And as Par mentioned yesterday, Alma has been making a lot of progress. Uh, he mentioned about D-Sharp uh, project, D-Sharp survey, which has been cited more than a thousand uh, times over two and a half years. This is another great example, HL Tau. Uh, this is from the 2014 Alma Long Baseline campaign. And of course, ARMA has been improving our understanding of you know, general field of astronomy, but in particular for circumstellar disks, uh, star planet formation, uh, ARMA has been really pushing the boundary of our understanding. So this is showing a gallery of disk substructures. This is just a subset. Uh, so what you see is uh, there are rings and gaps. In, uh, it turned out that uh, mo the most common type of substructures are rings and gaps. And also there are rings and a big cavity at the middle of the disk. And there are arcs like this banana shaped vortices or arcs uh, depending on how you, call, how you wanna call. And also there are spiral arms in the disk like these ones, two on the spirals you see here. So this is great. Uh, we see a diverse substructures. One thing I'd like to highlight though from the observational side is that we are still uh, you know, looking at low hanging fruits. Uh, this is a plot where uh, on the x-axis uh, it is showing uh, the flux at 1.3 millimeter uh, in Milijansky unit in low scale. So brighter disk on the right hand side, uh, fainter disk on the left hand side. On the y axis, is uh, this is a disk size uh, measured in continuum, millimeter continuum, but divided by the full width half maximum of the beam. So you can think of this as a resolution element, which actually you can see like this beam shape here. So size of the beam. So what this shows is that uh you we see more structures in brighter and larger disk which is uh, upper right, right corner of the this diagram so the red dots are disks with substructures uh blue dots are without substructures and as you can see here uh smaller and less bright uh, disk we don't have as good data as as good data as these bright disks uh they are oftentimes you know observed with uh pretty big uh beam and only integrated over a few minutes uh, from surveys. So it is a great question. It, it, it will be interesting to see what these small and fainter disks would look like when we look at uh, them with sufficiently high uh, angular resolution and sensitivity. And I believe we will get an answer uh, in the next few years about this. So from the theoretical side, of course, the big question we'd like to answer is, you know, what have created all these, these substructures and why are there so much diversity, right? So this morning, Laura and Hill wanted, to make, uh, wanted me to tell you all about the disk substructures. Unfortunately, I cannot go through every single uh, topic in this incomplete list, but this is, I'd like to tell you that this is a really active area of research now, right now. A lot of people are working on different topics that can possibly create these substructures. Uh, I will focus only on planet disk interaction in my talk, but I'd like to mention that uh, I and my colleagues are in preparation of a review chapter in Pro Star and Planets uh, 7 conference, which is going to happen next March, March next year. So uh, hopefully soon, yeah, we can tell you more about, you know, what mechanisms might uh, be more viable than others and how can we actually distinguish different mechanisms observationally. 
Okay, so if these disk substructures are created by planets in the disk, uh, then we can learn a lot about planet formation processes or planet properties themselves, like uh, mass and semi-major axis of the overall uh, their their orbits. Or we can also think about how and where and when planets form in protoplanetary disks. And also we can learn about how planets interact with their parent fault disks, right? But I'd like to tell you that even if these substructures are not created by planets, but something else, some other mechanisms, uh, we can still learn a lot about planet formation processes. One thing I'd like to highlight is that in a lot of planet formation uh, simulations theories, we oftentimes assume that the disk is smooth uh, in terms of surface density distribution, temperature distribution. We oftentimes adopt power law distribution, but as you can see here, if this is created by something else than planets and these disks don't have uh, planets at the moment, then what this might tell us is that, well, the initial condition may not be smooth, right? They, uh, the grains are uh, collected in narrow radial regions or narrow uh, radial or azimuthal regions. So we might need to think about that uh, and how we can implement this kind of distribution initial conditions in planet formation models. So I'm talking about these substructures and I'm trying to connect uh, planets and these substructures. And you might wanna ask, why not just go find these uh, planets in those disks? Because we know that there are a lot of planets at least in our galaxy and we have discovered uh, more than 4,000 exoplanets by far using various methods. Uh, but unfortunately we cannot use most of them. Uh, here are two main methods that we found exoplanets. When I say exoplanets, I mean uh, mature exoplanets. Those are orbiting around older stars. They, they don't have uh, circumstellar disks anymore. So both transit and radial velocity method. If you look at this animation, you need to be able to see the stars, right? If you think about transit method, you are taking light curve over time of the star and you are trying to find the little dip uh, which is which can be very small, right? And you also need the system, the star and planetary system to be aligned our line of sight. So you need to see those uh, system edge on. And also for radial velocity, we need to take many spectra over time. So you need to be able to see the stars directly. But unfortunately, young stars, they are surrounded by circumstellar disks. These are uh, three images. Uh, for adjunct disk, what you see here in color scale, uh, orange, purple, uh, those are near infrared scare light image, which is tracing small grains lofted up, up to the surface. So if you look at this particular object, you see the upper surface here. And this is the, the other side of the disk. And then in between, there's the dark lane. And this is dark because the disk is optically too optically thick and we are looking at from the adjunct view. So the starlight, they are all blocked by the disk material. So we don't, what that means is that you cannot see through the disk, you cannot see the star directly most of the time. So again, the bottom line here is that the most successful exoplanet detection techniques, namely transit and radial velocity method, they cannot be applied to finding young planets. So this is a problem. So we need something else than, you know, those methods. And here's where planet disk interaction comes into play. So as I said in the previous slide, uh, disks can cause a huge problem in finding planets, but now I'm trying to flip this around and take advantage of the presence of the disk. So uh, planet, what planets can do is, as you can see in the simulation where I'm presenting a gas disk, gas surface distribution, and also dust distribution in this particular case, uh, particle size of 300 micrometer. And there's one planet, one giant planet in the disk. And you can see that planets can create spirals uh, through Lindblad resonance. And as those spirals shock the disk gas, they can exchange angular momentum with the disk gas. So they open a gap around the planet's orbit. And also vortices can form at the gap edge as the gap edge becomes unstable to the Rossby wave instability. 
And also planets can open inner cavities uh, when there are multiple planets or where there, uh, when there is a single planet, but the single planet has very large orbital eccentricity. So I'm just going through what planets can do here, but if you're interested in more detail about more details about each of these mechanisms i have uh, them explained a little bit more detail in my youtube video so i recommend you to watch that so okay let's assume that those uh, these substructures are formed by uh, planets then what you can do is of course there's a big if but you can try to infer the planet's mass and orbital same major axis so this plot on the right hand side, uh, you might have seen this before, those gray dots, they are showing planet masses. The gray ones are uh, mature exoplanets. So in terms of uh, planet mass in units of Jupiter masses as a function of their orbital semi-major axis or distance to their host stars. And we see a lot of planets, mostly closed-in planets, and these different colored regions, they are showing uh, the parameter space where the current exoplanet detection techniques can find uh, exoplanets around uh, other stars. And now I collected data from board modeling of uh, planet disk interaction simulation mostly, where uh, people try to reproduce these kind of observations where you see rings and gaps, spirals, you try to put a planet to reproduce these observations um, and you need to assume certain mass at certain and certain location of the planet. So these are data are collected and you can see that it seems like uh, there is a great population beyond 10 AU, uh, beyond about, you know, 0.1 to uh, 10 Jupiter masses. So this is really interesting. It seems like that there is a, a general population, at least for the disk that we have been looking at in detail. And you might want to ask, okay, assuming that there are a lot of planets at this parameter space, how would they evolve in the next few million years, right? Would they migrate inward to become cold giant or hot Jupiter? Or while they are migrating, they might be able to lose some of their uh, atmosphere and become super Earth or mini Neptune sized planets, or they can just stay there uh, for a billion years. We don't have an answer, but this is certainly an interesting point. Okay, so for the last few minutes, I'd like to tell you, you know, I'd like to answer if the fact that we see these substructures means that there are planets in the disk. And the answer is, of course, no. And I'm giving you just one ex particular example. And that is because one planet can create multiple rings and gaps. So here is a simulation, again, where I put a single planet and it, it excites uh, multiple spirals and each of those spirals open a gap. So what that means is that when you, have, when you look at the image, right, we see multiple rings and gaps. Uh, so let's say you have uh, three gaps from your observation. What does that mean? Even if, uh, what you can think is that there are three planets, one, each, one in each gap, but they may not be necessarily the case. One planet can open two gaps, three gaps, four gaps. So we cannot really connect, directly connect planets to these substructures. There's no one-to-one -one connection between them. So what should we do? So it might be a little disappointing answer if you were expecting me to tell you all the secrets of planet disk interaction and how we can magically solve all the problems. But I'd argue that we really need more direct detections of those planets. And here are uh, some examples. We can expect to see thermal emission coming from the planet. We can expect to detect circumplanetary disk. We can expect to detect HR4 line emission or other accretion tracers as planets grow in mass by accreting uh, circumstellar or circumplanetary disk material. And here's a great example for PDS-70. I recall yesterday, uh, someone asked what is the cause of the big cavity in the PDS-70 disk, and this is why. There are two giant planets. So on the left, what you see is near-infrared detection, so thermal emission coming from the two planets, uh, PDS-70B and C. Uh, in the, Left middle, what is shown here is H alpha line emission. Again, at the same location, we see H alpha uh, line detected. And this is millimeter continuum. Again, uh, this disk has a big ring and a big cavity. And you clearly see there's some dust emission at the location of the C. 
And this is what we are expecting from simulation side or theoretical side. As I said earlier, if there are multiple planets, they can create a big cavity. And this is what you exactly see here. So in the last couple of slides, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how, what, what is our future. So I showed you a great example of directly detecting young planets, but I should tell you that PDS-70, because it has a big cavity, we, have, we probably have a favorable condition for direct imaging, but it's still challenging to find young planets that are embedded in the disk. So one way to do that is uh, to go for longer wavelengths using JWST, for example. So this is a simulated image uh, for HD 16396. At 11 micrometer, again, we can see through the disk better, uh, even if the uh, disk ex extinction is taken into account. The other one is covered uh, briefly by Laura this morning. Uh, we can look at the kinematics. Uh, planets generate perturbation to the disk gas and dust. So you can look for some signature uh, in the gas molecule using molecular line emission. And I'd like to point out this uh, diagram from Exoplanet Archive. There is this item called this kinematics, uh, which is registered as a viable method to find young planets. And what this is referring to is to actually look for kinematic planetary signature in ALMA data. So with that, I will stop uh, my talk and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a really interesting talk. Um, wow, there's a lot of questions and I'm, uh, please, go, um, do, if your question isn't asked, it will be answered uh, in due time. Um, but there were a lot of questions on how a single planet can actually form multiple gaps. Um, does a planet need to be further out of the disk to cause multiple gaps? Um, or could you get a gaps from a, a planet that was sort of further into a disk, for example? Could you, could you sort of explain sort of what the conditions are for the multiple gaps? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so that's two steps. So planet, so as you can already see from here, one planet can excite multiple spirals. Uh, this is one in the outer disk. There's another one in the inner disk. It's a little faint, but that is another one uh, trying to excite uh, here. So planet, it's not just one planet except one spiral. You can actually show this using linear analysis and uh, uh, there are multiple papers on this. So planet excite multiple spirals and each of those spirals, they, uh, they open a gap as the spiral shocks the disk gas. So for, for example, in this example, this outer spiral shocks at this radial location this inner spiral shocks the disk at this location. So those two together open the big gap around the planet. And there's a second spiral arm in the inner disk, which is not shown, sorry about that very well, but here's another one. And as it shows up, because it uh, excites at different radius in the disk, uh, it creates a gap at different location in the disk. And um, the main thing that determines the number of gaps, uh, it depends on various parameters, including uh, planet mass and this uh, disk temperature and also viscosity of the disk. But yeah, I'd say this is a robust uh, phenomenon or mechanism. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, let's see, is there one? I, I, th I think maybe we should, I, th I think we're roughly out of time for this talk, is that right, Don? Um, yes, yeah, so maybe we should move on to the next section, but, but there are a very sort of vigorous num uh, sort of di discussion, or I should say uh, questions going on uh, in the Q&A. So um, I encourage you, JM, to go and answer some of these. Sure. I'll okay, well, thank you. yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for all the speakers today. This has really been a fascinating session and um, I, I really enjoyed, I'm sure everyone here has enjoyed every one of these talks. And so I, I think I now hand this over to the next chair. Thank you.